Welcome to Trusting After Trauma, Season 5, Finding Freedom After Narcissistic Abuse. I'm your host, Pi Venus Winslow. Our goal is to provide information and resources to educate and empower viewers to recover from narcissistic abuse and childhood trauma so they can reclaim their health, happiness, and personal power. Our speakers specialize in supporting others through their unique expertise and offer valuable insights, tools, and inspiration for viewers to find the courage and motivation to change their lives. I'm super excited to have Randy Fine here with us today. Randy Fine is a narcissistic personality disorder expert, coach, author, podcast host, and guiding spirit in the narcissistic abuse awareness movement. As a coach and counselor, Randy Fine has compassionately guided thousands of people, both nationally and internationally, in their life journeys. A professional writer, her highly regarded blog, Narcissistic Abuse Awareness and Guidance with Randy Fine, is translated and read in 180 countries worldwide. Randy is the show host of the acclaimed blog talk radio podcast, A Fine Time for Healing. She is the author of Close Encounters of the Worst Kind, The Narcissistic Abuse Survivor's Guide to Healing and Recovery, and Close Encounters of the Worst Kind Comprehensive Recovery Workbook for Survivors of Narcissistic Abuse, and Cliffage Road, a Memoir. And Randy resides in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. So welcome, Randy. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Pi. Um, It's really great to be here. Thanks for inviting me. I look forward to chatting with you. Yeah, yeah. So you're a narcissistic abuse uh, and a narcissistic personality disorder expert. And Mm -hmm. so... And you're very passionate about this topic. So can you give us a little background why why that is? Sure. Um, so I realized at age 42 that um, I grew up with a narcissistic mother. I never really knew why everything was so weird. And I think this is the case with pretty much everybody that grows up in these homes. We don't really know. We can't put our finger on what it is. But when I finally figured it out, I went on a journey of uh, searching for how to get over this and how to heal and how to understand it. And this was a long time ago. So there really wasn't internet. There was no, all these YouTubes and things like that out there. So I really kind of was on my own. But from all the research that I learned, I started writing articles and then I was asked to start helping people. So I've been doing this for about 15 years and it's really the only thing that I could do because it's the thing I'm most passionate about. It's the thing that I feel is so um, primarily responsible in the global population for the problems that are out there, alcoholism, drug addiction, and all the other things that are that are happening in this world. So uh, because I believe this is at an epidemic level and we really need to do something to stop this and to help people that have gone through it. Yeah, I totally agree. And and it seems like, and I agree, it, a narcissistic abuse or nar- narcissistic personality disorder was not something I was reading about 10 years ago, but now it's it's become a very popular topic and people are wanting to learn more about it. Um, so can you clarify, is, is narcissist, is narcissism and narcissistic personality disorder the same thing? Thank you for asking that. Actually, this is a question that it's really important and I'm glad you asked it. No, they're not. They're not because we all have some degree of narcissism in us. That's our ego. And some people have more, some people have these, you know, full blown, uh, over the top kind of personalities, they brag and they're, you know, kind of obnoxious, but they don't have the personality disorder. The personality disorder is something that forms in childhood and it is a major mental health issue that is a permanent 
change that happens to the psyche of that child. And it's something that they carry with for the rest of their life. Now, the difference you would find is that somebody who doesn't have the personality disorder is not going to have the same type of reactions like the rage and the silent treatments and things like that when they're criticized or called on their behavior. They also can understand because they have introspection, they can understand another person's point of view. They, that's empathy. Mm -hmm. A person with NPD uh, doesn't have any of those things. So they are devoid of empathy. They're devoid of uh, the ability to love. And they're pretty awful because everything that they do is to feed on other people. So emotions and reactions and things like that. So these are very, very two very different things. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so and I'm sure some people listening, um, many, many people who uh, who come in and join th this event and want to learn more about it are are empathetic people, are compassionate people. And that's why they're interested in this sub subject, because they've experienced uh, trauma from abuse themselves. And so for people who are trying to wrap their head around narcissistic personality disorder, um, you know, some people might want to have compassion if if they if they're thinking it's a mental illness and that people can get well, uh, mm -hmm. people can change and recover. So, can you talk a little bit about that? Sure, I can. Another really good question. Um, I get asked quite often, Randy, don't you have a soft spot for these people? You know, come on, you know, they're, they're humans and they're, um, you know, there's got to be a part of them that's good. And I can honestly tell you in the 15 years that I've been doing this work, that I cannot find one redeeming quality to a person with this personality disorder. Yes, it's a mental health issue. It's um, it is a mental illness per, illness per se. It's really a personality disorder. But just to put it in context, narcissistic personality disorder is almost the same thing as psychopathy and sociopathy. So these narcissists are, for the most part, psychopaths and sociopaths. There is a distinction between them. The distinction is the psychopaths and the sociopaths are cruel and they do what they do because they enjoy it. The narcissist enjoys it, but they do what they do because they seek narcissistic supply, which is attention, ad adulation, and, ad and um, admiration. And so there's that's the only distinct difference. However, none of them have empathy. And because of the nature of the disorder and how it forms, it is a permanent change that, like I said, it forms in childhood and the child basically shuts out their reality. They decide they're going to have an alter ego for the rest of their life. And that's going to be a fence, a block for them to never, ever feel the humiliation and pain that they feel as a child. And once they develop this false self, this alter ego, it is not going, it cannot be changed because the somebody with this personality disorder had literally has no ability to see that they are wrong in any way it's not that they don't want to they cannot see it they are perfect so nobody's going to get better if they can't look within and say well you know i have some responsibility here so it's they really are parasites and predators and and that's pretty much it mm -hmm. yeah yeah that's my experience too um no personal responsibility for their None. behavior yeah and how it affects other people um how prevalent is would you say narcissistic abuse is in our society you know the the obviously the world has narcissists in it but how how, how does it impact other people? Okay. Well, 
if you look up statistics on this, um, the Mayo Clinic says I think one to two percent of the population has narcissistic personality disorder. I think a just a very modest guess is that 25% of the global population has this, but I do believe it's more than that. Um, for every person who has this disorder, at least 10 people are going to be affected. So those numbers are huge, millions and millions and millions of people around the globe suffer from this kind of abuse. Mm -hmm. Yep. It's, it's pretty bad. Um, people tell me they think it's like 50%. I, I'm going to, you know, be modest and say moderate and say 25, but it is at least one out of every four. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I would think, I mean, I would go so far as to say you probably will not get through your lifetime without interacting and having, having some sort of, um, relationship with somebody who has this disorder and it will impact you it will impact you in a profound way because it's um you can't mistake it once you've experienced it and you can recognize it and you know what it is it's like oh <laughs> okay yeah absolutely um everybody will experience people like this and even people who don't realize they have have, whether it be in their family, whether it be someone they dated or a spouse or uh, in the workplace or a friend. Mm -hmm. And generally people who are very empathetic, very good natured, very understanding. These are the kind of people that that narcissists are drawn to mm -hmm. because they can't manipulate people that are like them. They need people who have good faith and care and are willing to look past things and uh, overlook you know a, a person's history whatever it is that they you know that they're showing uh, good people will say oh that's okay you know i'll love you i'll love you so much you'll never have to feel like that again mm -hmm. they'll tell you they can't love they'll tell you that they've never had a healthy relationship and a good person will say, that's okay. Yeah. I'm going to show you what love is. Mm -hmm. I'm going to show you and you're going to love. But see, we have no idea mm -hmm. what really monsters these people are. There's no way that they can do these things. They just can't, no matter who, who they're with. <gasps> yeah, yeah. And they're tricky. They, they, they know how to they know how to fake it for a while and then eventually that mask slips and um the real the real the real narcissist comes out um what what would you say are symptoms of narcissistic abuse for people who are like you know i'm not sure um describing it might help them to um to identify where they may have experienced that in their in their lives or in their past but also um people who um people who aren't really sure i think it would help to validate what they might be experiencing okay sure one of the things that you will notice if you're with a narcissist is that as i said earlier they cannot be wrong and it doesn't even matter how you approach it. If they tell you they want something and you have a different idea, another opinion, whether you say, I wish you would say that more nice, you know, in a nicer way, you know, you know, uh, however you say it, you could be calling them every name under the sun, or you could be asking them very kindly to do it differently. They will have a very severe reaction to that. Um, whether it be rage outwardly or pernicious rage, which is um, the silent treatment, mm -hmm. which a lot of people get. And sometimes the silent treatment can be worse. But these are both ways that they get this attention that they need. They can feed off of our emotions. And these, these two ways are, these two uh, behaviors are very manipulative. Um, another thing is that you will find that you lose yourself. You'll find that 
you're you're not at all the person that you used to be. You'll find that you are um, pretty much a puppet, and you walk on eggshells at all times. And if because if you don't do it their way, your life becomes a miserable one. Mm -hmm. So they train us, they groom us to do it their way. Um, they don't want to hear, they don't care who you are. They really don't care who you are. They don't look beyond what is in their, what will fulfill their need. And I want to say with narcissistic supply, because people think, you know, attention, okay, well, why are they abusing if they want attention? So attention can be any way it can be um you can be saying nice things to them or you could be calling them names you could be reacting to them you could be giving them you know walking away from them whatever it is if you are reacting to their behavior that is food for them mm -hmm. and they must have this food 24 7. it's a it's an addiction like a heroin that they can't survive not five minutes without it. Um, other things you'll notice is, you know, besides the manipulation, the gaslighting. Um, they'll tell you that you didn't hear what you heard, see what you saw. Mm -hmm. They'll tell you you didn't say what you said or that they didn't say what they said. That's uh, one of the more popular tactics that they use. And it makes you feel crazy. And after a while, you don't trust your own intuition. You don't trust um, your judgment mm -hmm. at all. You lose that ability because they're constantly telling you that you're wrong about your opinion and whatever you've observed. Um, that's another thing is that you will observe things and they will tell you that these things didn't happen when you know that you said it or it happened or you were there. They'll tell you you weren't you know, you didn't go to Mexico when you spent two weeks there with them, you know, just however they want to do that, because they want you to get upset. They feed on that. Yeah. 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 And that, and, and it's, it, it's, it's very disorienting, confusing, crazy making. And so, you know, you help people who recover from these relationships, mm -hmm. um, what, why did they, I, why is it so hard to break, break from that relationship? So narcissists create an addiction in us. So when you're, if, so let's just talk about romantic relationships in adulthood. Mm -hmm. So the way that they groom you in the beginning is through love bombing. The love bombing is supposed to get you on such a high and make you fall head over heels over this person, um, even if you don't really want to. And that high is brain chemicals. It's it it's oxytocin. It's serotonin. It's it's the good the feel good things. So they get you on such a high over them what they're showing you at this point is the perfect partner, the soulmate, the, you know, the one who checks every box and you just can't believe you met this person. But at some point that's going to change. Once they know they've got you, whether you've agreed that you love them, you've moved in together, you get engaged, you get married, whatever it is, there's a pivotal point in which they say, gotcha. And that's when everything changes. But a normal person, let's say a non-narcissistic person, is going to blame themselves when this happens. What did I do wrong? Why is why am I not being, you know, he or she liked everything I did before. Now he or she doesn't like anything I do. Right. I'm blamed for everything. So what am I doing wrong? Because I know this person loved me. I know this person loved me. And it's a, a, a real um, mind game. That, that happens because you cannot imagine that the person you met was an imposter. There's no way that person was so wonderful. But again, you've developed this addiction to this person. Mm -hmm. So you 
want to get back that feeling that you had in the beginning. And that's one of the major things. There's other tactics that they use. One is future faking, where they will um, make plans with you. They'll appeal to your hopes and dreams. And you will have these visions of what you're going to do together. They become very real for you. Mm -hmm. They're not real at all. But for you, they are. And so it's very hard to let go of those hopes and dreams. Um, also, uh, most people believe that they are in love with their abuser. And when I ask them, what do you love? I usually get silence. And then I ask them, what did you love in the beginning? So what happens is we fall in love with the imposter and we end up stuck with the abuser. Mm -hmm. And our minds don't go there. We have no filter. We have no ability to process this kind of thing because it's not what a normal, the, the normal function of a brain. Yeah. Yeah. May it make that, that totally makes sense. I like the way that you described that. Um, so for people who, so for people who grew up with a narcissistic parent, like you, like me, um, and for people who are watching, who might be wondering, like, where, where did all of this start? Where did these patterns start in my life with the kinds of people that are in my life? How does narcissistic abuse in childhood manifest itself in adulthood? Okay. Really, really good question. Narcissistic parents um, they're not really parents. What they are is narcissists playing the role of a mother or a father because they get supply by doing that. But when they have children, their goal is not to raise healthy adults. Their goal is to raise dependent children that they can constantly feed on. They don't want to give you um, any tools that are going to help you pull away because that's the biggest threat to a narcissist. So all along, they're depriving you of the, the tools that you're going to need in adulthood. Mm -hmm. Boundaries, self-love, self-esteem, self-validation. Um, and so when you get to be an adult, not only are you conditioned to accept abuse, but you don't have the tools for living. And so what happens generally is you get to be an adult where all your friends are sort of soaring, you know, they're doing really well in life and you go, Phew! you start having bad relationships. Mm -hmm. You get in with, you find yourself with abusive people, abusive friends, abusive relationships. Um, you can be very codependent, very insecure. And you'll notice that your relationships are not healthy ones and you are settling for things less than, really what you deserve. Mm -hmm. So not only are you, do you not have the tools for adulthood? Um, you know, it's like, if you think about a building, a building has to have a concrete foundation or it can't be built. Our foundation, children of narcissistic parents, it's like a house of cards. There's no foundation. So it builds up and it falls and it builds up and it falls. There's nothing under us. And what we have to do as adults to get through this and get better mm -hmm. is we have to create this foundation with all the things that we did not get as children. We have to raise ourselves. And that's when our life gets better. Yeah. Wow. Wow. And and while you were talking about getting into abusive relationships, I, I heard a little voice in my own head saying, oh, and we self-abuse. We self-abuse, too. Oh, we're our worst enemies. We beat ourselves up over everything. We mm -hmm. take blame for everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow. Um, you've shared so much today. Um, one more one more question um, for people who have been raised by a narcissistic parent. And, you know, we, we talked about how it's hard to break away from uh, abusive relationships with a narcissist, but there's a, there's another layer when it's a parent because, you know, like uh, the 10 commandments, honor thy mother and father. There's, you know, family is everything. Um, 
you know, don't disrespect your parents. So what do you, what, what advice would you give people who, um, who are struggling with that? Okay. There is no God in the world or whatever. There's no God that's going to tell you that you should be in an abusive relationship. And the marriage contract, if you get married to these people, um, so we're, we're talking about childhood, but I just want to say this. If you get married to these people, it, the contract is null and void because it was a bait and switch situation. You didn't get what you wanted, okay? Um, as far as parents go, what we have to understand is, as I said earlier, narcissists are not mothers, they're not fathers. And the family system that is around this narcissistic parent, and I say around because families are, everybody's kind of loyal and faithful and they care about each other. And they have, This is more like a hierarchy where, the, where the, narc, the, the narc is like on the throne and then, you know, the spouse or whatever circling around them and then the peasants or the kids circling around them. This is not a family system. There's no loyalty here. Um, and what I find is that in families where there is more than one child, only one child rises up out of this. The rest of them, when one child gets healthy, the rest of them get sicker because they go in and try to, they want your supply. They want what you're giving up. Um, so the family system is not a family in itself. You know, and so I tell people this, you know, you don't have a typical family system. It's try, they try to put in your head that you need to be faithful and loyal to your family. As far as the mother and the father, honoring thy mother and thy father, um, as I said, narcissists are neither mothers nor are they fathers. They have no maternal instincts. They have no paternal instincts. What they are is narcissists masquerading as a role that gets them what they want. And what they want is narcissistic supply. So having a family, having a spouse, having children is a way for them to have food all the time. Because especially with children, they can begin programming you, conditioning you from the day you're born. Yeah. And so you don't even know what's happening. And generally the other parent doesn't even really see what's happening. Mm -hmm. So you grow up conditioned you grow up often enmeshed in this parent there are several ways that narcissistic parents will enmesh with you so that you don't have a self and as i said earlier the goal is to keep you from having a self so they try to keep you through guilt through religion whatever it is and believe me i have had people say to me what about the ten commandments you know because i tried with my parents to have limited contact, I try to set boundaries, they ran right over. Mm -hmm. I have no choice but to take care of me. Mm -hmm. There comes a point where you have to say, you know, family is not necessarily forever for everybody. Mm -hmm. And what's most important is that we're okay, that we can walk through this life feeling good about ourselves. We cannot, you know, and the guilt is a hard one to let go of. It really is. Um, and it takes people a while. And I usually have them um sort of give themselves maybe a month or so where they tell the parent that they're going through something and they just are going to be away from them for a little while because in that time it gives them that chance to not have the phone calls and the texts and the things like that and they can begin to process what it feels like to have peace in their life mm -hmm. and usually by the end of that time they're going i don't want to invite that back in Right. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Oh my goodness, Randy. What a conversation while you're talking. I was just getting chills with you talking about everything that you talked about. Cause I was like, yep. Yeah. So much to this. <laughs> it is. It is. So you've got a free gift for our viewers today. Could you tell us about that? Sure. Um, it's a, uh, a home workshop, mini home workshop called Identifying Your Emotional 
um, your emotions or whatever, your emotional pain, that's what it is. Mm -hmm. And so um, I give you a little bit of a background on what this is about, and then I sort of take you through age, age groups. Mm -hmm. And I have you take a look at the different emotions, positive and negative, that you may have had during those times. And really try to think about why you felt the way that you did it at those ages, um, you know, so that you can get a feeling for maybe what you didn't gain, what you don't have, or maybe emotions that you have blocked because living in a home like this, in a, in a dysfunctional, chaotic, crazy home, we develop these maladaptive coping mechanisms, and one of them is that we put walls up, we block it because it's too painful. Mm -hmm. Children don't have the ability to exist in these environments in a healthy way. They have to find a way to do this, and it's always going to be maladaptive and unhealthy. Mm -hmm. So often people don't know what their feelings are. They've never felt them. They're afraid of them. They're afraid of the feelings. So this is a way to begin to identify how you're feeling. It's very important as an adult to be able to connect with your emotions and your feelings. Yeah, absolutely. Well, that sounds amazing, super valuable. And so for, for all of our viewers and listeners, make sure that you click the link provided with this interview to get access to that workshop. Right. Yeah. So Randy, I just want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for sharing your expertise and your experience and this valuable gift with us today. I really oh, appreciate it. It's been my pleasure. Um, and I hope that the listeners find value in it and, um, you know, and that they can find a way to get help and healing. Nobody has to stay in pain. You know, this, this is something where people think this is like a life sentence that they have to stay in. Mm -hmm. No this the this pain can be healed and it's not something that you can necessarily do on your own you need a professional to guide you through this okay because your mind is not going to allow you to view this in a different way so um it's important that people get help yeah absolutely absolutely so thank you randy so much for being here today and thank you to everybody who is watching and joining us for trusting after trauma season five we hope that you enjoy this journey with our experts on how we can find freedom after narcissistic abuse and heal our body mind and spirit to live joyful authentic lives